Yes, people, Killer Keller here, live from the Arts Arcade, Piccadilly Circus for Keller Vision. This is the Street Culture Podcast. This is where we delve deep into the minds of people that began their careers in the humble world of street culture and made their way into global success. Today, we have global street art CEO, not to mention curator, archivist in his own right with a whole heap of street art memorabilia. This is Lee Bofkin. Lee Bofkin. Akela Keller, my friend, it's lovely to see you again. Good to see you too. How have you been? Uh, all right, we are just wrapping up London Mural Festival this week. Um, Mr. Doodle is going to paint the last mural uh, of the festival. Wow. It's gone really well. The artists have been amazing. The art produced has been amazing. Um, we are all shattered and in need of a break, but it's been uh, one hell of a ride. Yeah. I mean, this is no mean feat to, to do a London Mirror for the, the expectation on just that those words together alone. Yeah. Is a, <laughs> well, that was kind of what, you know, I mean, before we were doing London Mural Festival, we did things like Sydenham Street Art Festival. Mm -hmm. We helped organise Broccoli Street Art Festival, which carried on for some years. Mm -hmm. But because we were active in so many neighbourhoods, there was a dream to fulfil of going London wide. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's kind of easier to get walls here, walls there, et cetera, et cetera. But then to try and tie that together with a cohesive event, uh, is 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 one of the challenges. We did the first London Mural Festival in 2020. We worked with uh, 200 artists across 75 sites. This time for this London Mural Festival, we've completed 140 permanent murals at last count, working with over 300 artists uh, in 10 different London boroughs. So wow. we were producing up to 30, 40 murals a week. Uh, it's a major effort from 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 the from the company Global Street Art to make that happen, um, but the majority, I'd say, eighty to ninety percent of the murals that were painted four years ago, because it's every four years, mm -hmm. are still there. So I'm expecting as many to survive mm -hmm. for years to come afterwards. So with the amount that we've painted before and the amount that um, has been painted as part of this festival, it's a it's a lot. Yeah. It's, a, it's a lot of murals. I think over 80 of the 140 are in housing estates as well. So there's some amazing permanent work by Best Etam, Mr. Trish, like lots of well-known names. There's a gorgeous one by El Seed mm -hmm. um, in lots of different housing estates across London. And they uh, that's where the big walls are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and there's some really beautiful work that's been produced. So I couldn't be happier with the outcome, mm -hmm. with the art and the artist. But um, everyone is duly exhausted. Yeah, I can imagine. You've got a variety of, of artists in your stable that uh, you know you draw on to, to yeah. complete tasks and jobs and yeah. big projects. Yeah. How, how do you how do you even begin to manage that? <laughs> like, where, uh, where it, does that begin? So I probably like want to step back for the people that haven't heard of or don't know Global Street Art. So. The organisation exists with a mission to live in painted cities. We've been going now for about 12 years. Mm -hmm. We're uh, about 35 full time. The business is a few things. There's a hand painted advertising side to it. That's the commercial arm. Mm -hmm. So it's literally it's large format murals for brands. Then there's uh, and then there's work for property developers, which are permanent public murals or near permanent public murals. Uh, so that's some of what we do. And then there's the big community side of what we do. Since 2012, we've organized 3,000 legal street art murals. If I showed you each of those for one second each, it would take longer than we're filming this <laughs> podcast for, really? which is an awful lot of community output. Wow. So there's the commercial stuff, keeps a roof over our head, but it also gives us the excess materials mm -hmm. that we give back to the artist community as well, but also just gives us the 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 team to be able to organize things like London Mural Festival because there's so much logistics that mm. just goes on behind the scenes. So, yeah, so I, that's the I background. Mean, there's an, yeah, there's an incredible ecosystem that you've created with where, you know, in a, to, to my uh, visibility, harmonious in that it, there's this constant cycle. Yeah. And like you say, the, the commercial offsets the community mm. that then offsets the street the graph the writers and everything just kind of feeds itself yeah i mean there's other hand painted companies doing hand painted advertising they don't have the same community involvement there's no necessity mm -hmm. that any commercial organization does this stuff but we started with a mission to live in painted cities and everything is about realizing what that looks like going forwards. Mm. And we tried different business models when we started, gallery shows, iPad apps, all sorts of things that just weren't sustainable. Mm -hmm. But ultimately this was the one thing that people kept coming back and asking for. So we kind of grew from there. It's, it's interesting to think about an ecosystem 
um, I think quite a lot about infrastructure mm -hmm. and the support that is needed to have an ecosystem of artists that are supported in going out painting big things because it takes time, effort, materials, money, like lifts, you know, <laughs> all of that stuff to be able to make big murals happen. And there is a gap in the UK of how our public murals are funded that say when we started uh, Urban Nation in Berlin, got it was really interesting to see they got a lot of government funding. Mm -hmm. The German system is a bit more like that, where that was able to support the, the production of large scale murals. With public funding in the UK, I think it's harder to access. I don't, I don't think we've got great experience and expertise in, in accessing that, that mm -hmm. those kind of funds, but you have to work twice as hard mm -hmm. for a lot less cash and you've got to do all the statistics and reporting that actually when you've got friends that it started that, you know, we're in town anyway, visiting from somewhere, this is pre-Brexit, mm -hmm. that just wanted to paint and they would call you and you had leftover materials. You don't want to wait three weeks and, a, and an application for a few, just here's paint, yeah. here's some walls we have permission for, go have fun if that's oh, what boots. you want to do. Yeah, and so what I tended to find is you have like a, almost like a city that wanted to be painted or was open to it, but some missing elements behind the scenes to support that at a level that it could be. Mm -hmm. So you have landlords that are open to having things painted. Increasingly, since you know 20 years ago, most of the street art or graffiti that you would see would be, this is before online, would be in your local neighborhood or in specialist books or magazines. Mm -hmm. That changed with uh, people moving from Flickr to Instagram and uh, smartphones. Yeah. Everyone became a publisher. Yeah. 10 years later, now everyone's seen murals through their news feed, through their Instagram, through their, you know, TikTok today or whatever it is, mm -hmm. that's created new fans that are open and now work in councils or mm -hmm. developers or for brands that are interested in working and partnering with artists in different ways mm -hmm. that wasn't there as much. So it's almost like the publishing of the art has fueled its own demand. Yes. And, and that's kind of how I think of public art in, art in public space is there's economic goods and then there's shared goods. Mm -hmm. Economic goods are the bottle of water. If you've got it, I can't have it. We can't share that. Of course, we could share the bottle of water. <laughs> but it's like one person owns something. But with a public good, the more of it that you can encourage, you set like the equilibrium higher. Mm. So the more that we go on to paint, the more appetite I think there is for painting. So it feeds itself. It should feed itself because it, it's not always the way. It needs the system under it like to water the roots, basically. Mm -hmm. But the idea is when people get really used to a great health service, no one wants to see the health service crumble. Mm. When people get used to seeing a lot of public art, it becomes an expectation that's you know implicit that I, I've grown up around this, I expect to see this art, that empty wall, while I'm used to seeing art there, there and there, that wall should have a mural on it and it encourages people to, to, to want to participate more in shaping their own public For space. sure, I get you. And especially, like you say, hip hop, 50 years of you know graffiti goes way back before then yeah but as as generations pass the familiarity and understanding of the culture and of course 50 years you know some of the biggest execs yeah. are working yeah. in the labels and they understand the nuances and the conversations that rappers have and what that Absolutely. music means yeah and people see that around like when you're walking around you know london today and you see the box parks box mm. parks came out of well there's roger wade that that that, that, that started that and that came out of box fresh there were <laughs> a lot of people right. wow. there are a lot of people that have come from community or scene sort of backgrounds that have changed approach mm. over time but you know none of us are getting any younger and we were talking about it before like when 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 how young we look how young we look <laughs> how great, yeah. when you're when we're at notting hill carnival that you'll see people in the uk hip-hop community 20 years later mm. that you knew back then yeah I, th I think a lot of people might not know this but i you know i used to be boy so soul mavericks is or was my crew when it existed but i was dancing for the uk when I was around 25, mm -hmm. and it was a knee injury that made me pick up a camera. I stopped dancing overnight and started photographing graffiti around the world That's at this really interesting time when the way that people shared media started to change. Yeah. So I was just, a wave came when I was trying to photograph as much graffiti around the world as so I possibly could. So when was that? Could. What date was that, roughly? That would have been around, I was dancing for the UK around 2005, yeah. UK Championships, uh, and then I got injured sort of shortly after, so late. 2000s, late noughties, mm. going into, and that was sort of like early Banksy kind of era. Yeah. Uh, street art came out as more, 
a lot of the graffiti that I saw around the time was was not in the city centre. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily accepted. It was in under you know uh, motorway bridges. You had to and go and like, find it. Basically. You had to go and find it, and it was often not in a place that people would go and hunt for it. Mm -hmm. But the artwork and the quality was absolutely amazing, mm -hmm. and I couldn't understand why there wasn't more of it in different places. But that was at the same time that the street art stuff came out that was more friendly to the public. It was mm. less inward looking. And and then it sort of took off with that. And that was sort of like 20 years ago. Mm. So I was really there, you know, at a time where there was an interesting cultural shift, probably brought about in part by changes in how we communicate, mm. thanks to like mobile phones. And, you know, a hundred years ago, it was before radio, there was mm. the printed word and it was mm. penny print newspaper, all the way now to we're not you know, communicating in images in the same way, it's now videos. Yeah, yeah, But yeah. those shifts in technology have had probably major and largely, to most of us, myself included, kind of unacknowledged consequences and impacts 100%. on subculture. 100%. I mean, you, could, you can pattern that with the, the rise of YouTube. I remember distinctively yeah. 2006, me at a photo shoot for GQ or something, yeah. and they were like, oh, we've seen you all on YouTube. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's, that could explain why I'm getting more attention and gigs. And I would imagine that was the same with breakdancing for its time. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, it went from when I was dancing, you would go down to Deal Real Records in Soho and try and get a badly copied VHS <laughs> yeah. to learn Style from, elements or something. Yeah, yeah. like in some context. And then it was like DVDs, but you still had to go somewhere to get them. Yeah. And then when YouTube basically came out and download speeds improved, all of a sudden you you can dance anywhere in the world yeah, yeah. and see it online the next day. Yeah, mind blowing. That had major impacts on like graffiti, b-boying, all subcultures. Mm. Remember like the early, and I got the books at home and I loved them, like the How to Break Dance book, mm -hmm. where it teaches you to do like the worm in like six pictures. Yeah, 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 yeah. And think that's how people were like distributing information to learn how to Crazy. dance. And you would learn locally mm. in your community with with whoever the local group of breakers was or lo group of local writers was. Mm -hmm. Fast forward something, you know, years later, decades later, people are more connected by the styles that they like mm. or identify with through online groups yep. often now than they are groups locally and in person. So we've, like all areas of life, we've traded some of that real person, real world experience mm. for a digital experience, yeah. which is a double-edged sword. Some of that, that's faster information and faster communication, but it's also less personal. Yeah. And then you get more homogeneity around the world or you rather you don't get like local styles. Mm -hmm. In graffiti, you would have like, you know, there was these London stars and these Manchester stars and things that I am not best qualified to talk about. Mm -hmm. But, you know, London straights, those kind of letters, yeah, yeah. I know a little bit. But the then, diamond cut chisel look. And yes. you take it later and, you know, and you, and you see now, well, someone learning grafted learning to write today is going to pick their hand style from loads of different books and references from all over the world yeah. and that has changed the way i mean so those are big changes yeah um and it's been a really interesting time for the last couple of decades therefore to be involved in any culture yeah i remember when parkour started <laughs> and you remember like the early there was like a, a early articles in the sun of like people doing parkour and showing someone in like a baby freeze walking to work doing a freeze. And it was obviously ridiculous the way they showed it. But then, you know, with that image share, with video sharing and YouTube, mm. it's had a, a major drive of the parkour culture because mm. people come together online. Just think about the Red Bull videos yeah. that have it's significant budgets. You are going to remember those 20 years later. Because yeah. like the one that I saw today of the guy on a BMX on a moving train. Yeah, wow, seen just crazy. amazing. And it's like, those things couldn't yeah. have been possible 30, 40 years no. ago at enough of a scale because there just wasn't enough space to broadcast it. Yes, that's right. With like the four terrestrial channels. The internet completely changes yeah. that. How far can you push something? Mm. Um, media, television, the four channels, etc. back in the day, for those of you that are from that time and space, you're lucky, thank yourself that. Um, there was, they, they would always push the stigma the, the propaganda of just the the, um, the undertones of negativity towards it graffiti definitely for sure it's always had that but that's part of the the appeal to a, a, a young person to to get involved yeah yeah it can be and I think it's sort of like self perpetuating yes um, but I've seen talks by people from BTP where they show images of like someone with a hoodie up holding a club and you're like that is it's not, not it's not that mm -hmm. Um, and I think those early narratives had, you know, fewer, 
there was less of an effort to understand the culture, yeah. less of an effort to broadcast its nuance because there were fewer channels. Yeah. It was very, this is that subculture, it looks like that, which is either going to recruit people or it's going to turn people off. But I yeah. think it did both at the same time. But it was a very binary narrative. Mm. When you look at graffiti culture around the world today, there's far more even like graffiti styles festivals. Yes. And then even like within the illegal side of the subculture, there's so much variation mm. uh, within that, that that's sort of like, that is being broadcast in like closed groups, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. That doesn't really exist. No, years it, didn't, ago. it didn't exist. So, it, you know, it's very big impacts in culture. Big time. Mm. Um, from a commercial standpoint, uh, working with a brand, well, Say any name, any name, any name. The bigger brands, especially. Sure. What, do, what do they want to see? And I know that it may seem like an obvious answer. They want to see street art of what their design is on the wall. But f through the journey of creating uh, the final, you know, reveal of a piece that perhaps has taken X Y Z amount of time to build. Yeah. What, what ultimately do? big brands want to see yeah. from a collaboration of a street art kind? So I guess there's like, there's a few different questions wrapped up in there because there's mostly like on the hand painted advertising side, mm. brands aren't looking at a street, generally looking at like a street art or tapping into a culture. Mm -hmm. They're trying to, trying to emphasize like craft, effort and skill because it's a difficult form of communication mm. that requires a very high level of skill to execute, they're saying that that reflects the brand. So where you look at the luxury brands, Gucci does art walls all around the world, For sure. that has very little to do with street culture, mm -hmm. and it's much more, or it's a lot closer to like the old painted signage that you would see in New York in the 70s, mm -hmm. the super elegant sign writing side mm -hmm. of it. That's very different from sort of the street culture side of yes. it. Um, there are brands like streetwear brands that will have an aesthetic, mm. then work with paint that is more aligned with like street culture. Mm -hmm. But then you'll also get like partnerships briefs where someone wants to work with an artist because there's a, hopefully a good alignment in like a brand wants to talk about this. This is part of their values. Mm -hmm. Patagonia has got an environmental, uh, uh, a, a strong sustainability message angle. Therefore, they want to work with an artist who does the same. Mm -hmm. So it's the idea that they're trying to broadcast something that aligns with whatever message mm -hmm. that they're trying to get out of it. So, you know, there's there's good collaborations and not so good collaborations. At its best, where a brand works with an artist, you can have something that really supports the artist in doing something they weren't able to do by themselves because it needs that bigger level of funding and that project. And you would see like amazing things, for example, with Insa, where you work for like, I think it was Ballantines or the whiskey yeah. company, painting giant floor mural gifts in deserts in South America, that's not something that you would just do off your own back that you've got the brand then mm. supporting that. And it's kind of interesting that I've even sort of like remembered that one because there's so much advertising that we're all exposed yeah. to so frequently that no one frankly remembers. <laughs> there's too much of it. But that's the impact that they want. Really poor. Yeah, that's the impact they want though, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, ideally you want like, if I, I don't, you know, if I, I, People remember very few things around a brand. No, that is true. Because there's too many brands out there. Yeah. Most people wouldn't care if most brands just stopped existing tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. So if a brand's going to get you to remember something, that it's cool or whatever, or you've got some positive mm. emotion, even if it's not vocalised, when you're ordering a drink at the bar, you might pick that whiskey mm. instead of a different one yeah. because of that. And I think it's that at the margins, you've got two there's a spectrum of what people try and achieve with advertising that is usually called somewhere between performance and brand. Mm -hmm. Performance as marketing or spend is like advertising is your digital stuff where people are trying to convert sales. So that's a lot of the online stuff mm -hmm. um, where they're just, but that doesn't build a brand. You get 10p off your Frosties in the morning or something because you've got a digital coupon, mm -hmm. whatever that mm -hmm. looks like. It doesn't, you, it doesn't make, you don't, it, it, it's very immediate. Yes, it doesn't but cultivate any sense of loyalty, does it? It doesn't cultivate any sense of loyalty. I don't think people should have that much no. loyalty with brands. It's not It's not necessary for anyone to do that. No. But if someone has consistently been there and down and supported a culture mm -hmm. for a very long period of time, then actually I would rather wear that than someone that didn't, Yeah, for which sure. kind of makes sense. So that's the sort of the brand end, which is someone's done something that doesn't convert to sales immediately, mm -hmm. but makes you feel different and fuzzy and better about that brand in one way or another, but it's much, it's harder to measure. Mm. And in a world of stats and data, people are much more at this very short term, short focused mm -hmm. 
quick delivery, just sell the product kind of end. Yeah. People don't really invest in, brands are less likely to invest in making something meaningful, doing yeah. meaningful work or something that's kind of cool or interesting. Yeah. So that's the, the we're, we're at the brand end and like helping brands like build themselves and change people's like, you know, the perception of what that brand stands yeah. for because they've worked with artists, because there's the craft, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but it's very different from like the, the short term, like sure. the punchy, the just get me a sale. And we're yeah. always competing against that because this stuff has got really good data. Mm. And we can get data about what we do, but it's never going to be as good and clean to be like someone clicked and they spent five pounds. It's the cultural currency of it, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's when a brand or a company know the value of what is being brought to the table mm. on a roots level. It, 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 you, of course, you have to equate it within data, etc. But the, yeah. the idea of, well, let's just let's just do it because it works with it's in alignment and it's it's got really good pickup in certain genres and areas. Yeah, I think in a world where data is more readily available, it's harder to have that conversation. Right. Because someone will always go back to their spreadsheet and say, "Well, there's this." And I can do that mm. and I can get 5% more sales. Why would I bother doing that? Mm. And that's a difficult conversation to have. Most brands get it, mm -hmm. but even individuals that work at that company are mm -hmm. under that pressure mm -hmm. versus data. What did this achieve? It's like, well, this was amazing and loads of people saw it, but I can't give you a data on what that mm. led to. And I think that's where, you know, that's one of the challenges. That's like in terms of like supporting art, art and artists to have careers where they do their own thing but can have the option to work with brands mm. there is this obligation to show that it works and that's really difficult it is that's difficult. a big challenge i can imagine so how do you how do, how do you approach that because we're also talking about the, the the smaller cogs in the machine when it yeah. comes to actually because it's not just one singular artist it's yeah. not you know this isn't you know you go to a, a gig and you see a singer perform and say, oh, that's great, but you know, you've also got the rest of the band. Yeah. It's very similar to doing a full-scale production piece on the side of the wall. You've got yeah. loads of little cogs, different artists, yeah. all of them with different yeah. levels of skill set and expectations, yeah. haven't you? Yeah, so I guess that's the, the operation side of it. And you know, from a client point of view, you want it to, you know, they say in project management, the, the, the basic metaphor is a swan. Mm. So above the water, you want everything to look smooth and like it's gliding and everything's great. But underneath the water, your legs are kicking as fast <laughs> as they can yeah. to just try and uh, to just just try and deliver what you set out to do and promise to do. Mm. And you know the brand promise we make is we don't leave a wall until a client is happy. Mm -hmm. We don't, you know, if you if you're you have a process. We try to develop as much process around making the paintings consistent as in like, and delivering something that clients are ultimately happy with. Because mm -hmm. if you paint five murals and four are great, but one isn't, mm -hmm. then that client's not coming back. Yeah. And that is a challenge relative to say, a digital screen. Mm. There are 16,000 digital screens in the company, in the country, sorry. There are 16,000 digital screens in the country that, you know, it's very easy to say, that was my advert, it went up on their tick, job done. Yeah, that's and right. And that, that, that ease and the like, almost like the, the lack of involvement from sort of like the a client side to just know that that's that mm. easy mm. is uh, is you know one of the challenges as well. That's why you got to make sure that everything we do is as good as it can be, and the process is repeatable. Yeah, it's, uh, and it's a complacency to many from a corporate end because just ticking the box yeah. just means that they can go you know get on with their their day to the next event or the next thing or the next launch of whatever it's, yeah yeah that will never produce inspiring work no and it will never produce like some level of societal change no. just and i mean that in terms of like london mural festival is is something that we invest in mm -hmm. it's a marketing what that means is it costs money right we don't make money out of it, it costs a mm -hmm. lot but you know in a in a business sense you call that marketing yes, right? That's right you yeah. invest in what that idea is and we don't do it for the stats and the data we do it because we believe in an idea mm. you will find people at companies that and and people at companies at different stages in their career mm -hmm. will care that much more about resonating with those crowds yeah. and some communities some brands have got that more in their culture red bull being a good example mm -hmm. because they do these cool things again and again and again they support athletes and they do etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. and there aren't that many brands out there that i would say deeply in like care mm. frankly that much over time mm -hmm. it's not to say that they don't care or the individuals don't care but it's very easy to do a project in one year but what you really want is someone to ideally go on a journey and develop a project and a mm. concept and an idea over time where there's something that you can build on. Yes. Because that helps culture move forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's very difficult, you know, and, and, and um, culture doesn't, does just happen. 
but it happens that much more where it is that supported. Mm -hmm. So being able to find anyone, you know, so I guess it comes back to all the, the same kind of conversation around how we support culture. Mm -hmm. um, and there just is a lack of alternatives, I think, within the UK from what we've seen about ways of, how to say it, culture is supported in the UK to a very small extent by a lot of official work. This place is amazing. Mm -hmm. Art Arcade that we're sitting in now, Arts Arcade is an amazing space. You've got um, an amazing, this is where we're filming today, right? So mm -hmm. you've got rooms for, for graffiti shows, you've got a library, you've got a space for dancers. Mm -hmm. That's an incredible, an incredible mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, Thank you, brother. And it's rare, mm -hmm. and it's really rare, so that that there is one space like this mm -hmm. can have a massive impact on generations of artists. Yeah. We were talking before about Trocadero yeah, as, a, right. as a space, and like anyone that was in the dance community in the last 20 years or so mm -hmm. knows about Trocadero and how special it was, because it was the one place in London that was easy to get to, it was free to dance, free to train, you had different groups of dancers, mm -hmm. dancing, training at the same time. And because it was a physical space for people from different dances to come together, you started to get this collaboration. Mm -hmm. You started to get people who were into that style that were now into that style that are then into that yep, style. Yeah, that's right. That was a, an amazing asset. And when it disappeared... People knew about it. People really felt that. Fragmented. Really fragmented. So because culture is not often or rather has a challenging funding model in this country, when someone contributes a little something, it can have a massive impact mm. because there's so few other people doing it. Yes. And that, I think, is also one of the other reasons for, for, I guess, brands, philanthropists, to some extent, you know, certain government programs, mm. to, to just aim to support more because it can have these long-term impacts. 100%. It's the butterfly effect. Yeah. Where if you... That's it. Give it... And sometimes it takes a little while for industry, uh, creatives in fact, to, to get wave of a new idea that, yeah. that this could be also reappropriated or repackaged or redone in a different way. Yeah. From a global street art's point of view, you know, you're trailblazing and you're, you're, you're road testing ideas that are so new. I don't... Th I, I get... I, it's just a, it's, it's an observation. I, yeah. I just feel that you're, you're, you're trying to, f you're, you're, it's a puzzle. Yeah. And you're, you're figuring it out. But I also get the feeling that the, not only is the best to, yet to come, but the best for the next generations is to come based on these uh, learning curves that are, you're constantly yeah. figuring out. I, I, Hope so. I hope there is, at the end of this, when I look back on my career some number of years from now, I hope we've left a legacy that outlasts me. The intent was to build something that I go off into the sunset and it carries on. Mm -hmm. um, and it carries on to try and be a positive force and impact public space. And it starts by increasing the amount of art in public space generally. Um, it takes some of that advertising budget that would have gone into digital screens or banners mm -hmm. and puts it via artists. It's the mission that we have, Live in Painted Cities, is an easy one for people to be like, I like that idea, I'm on board with that, mm -hmm. then we have to figure out what that means. Yeah. It's a mission statement. And it's purpose purposefully broad in order to give us the latitude to figure out what that means over time. Mm -hmm. um, I don't mistake a clear view and a short distance. I know in my mind's eye what that might look like 20 years from now. And it's an unachievable, unattainable goal. Mm. You can always go more, 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 but it's always convoluted. It's never an easy it's journey. It's never straight. It's, it's never a straight line. There is a relentless drive to innovate that is the pressure from advertising because advertising wants the new thing, mm -hmm. the next thing, because if you do something that someone did six months ago, it doesn't get shared in the same way. Yeah. And it's the same, artists are always experimenting to try and stand out as well. Everyone has this, is competing for an audience attention mm. in the same, often the same channels. The brands are going head to head with the artists through Instagram or TikTok. And yeah. it's, there is this, this drive with digital because it's about capturing attention that, that encourages everyone to try and innovate again and again and again. I think it often 
the innovation is probably in some respects a lot of it is unnecessary mm -hmm. because if the quality of something is just really good or really exceptional a really amazing design that is incredibly well painted it doesn't need to have a new paint or a new technology mm. that's part of it um but we've tried and and are trying to basically so there's another part to, to what Global Street Art is now, which is its gallery, which is a, a, just a room within our office that we've turned into essentially a, a mini museum to try and remember 150 odd years of creativity. And this gentleman has an exceptional amount of memorabilia within the street culture and, and pop culture as a whole. I mean, yeah. I don't know. It's I would incredible. say probably culture because pop yeah. culture's only really existed maybe 40s, 50s America, but yeah. 60s UK post-war. Comics, I mean, you've got everything, man. We have some comics in there, not, not vast amounts, but there's a lot of things that I think we've tried to collect that are overlooked. Yeah. And, and the idea behind that is to help people see something beautiful or interesting, interesting is enough, in things that we normally overlook. So in, in elements of, like, design. Yeah. Uh, but also, like... If you look at a collection of, say, Matchbox labels, mm -hmm. I'll just use it as a really weird example. There's so much that you can learn from that. Mm. How they communicate really like a lot of information or the key information in a very small space. A Matchbox label is, is this yeah, big. Yeah. But when someone takes a photograph of one of our murals or any art mural and shares it online, mm -hmm. it's shrunk down to the size of a Matchbox label on a mobile phone. Yeah. So if you're Whatever you're trying, if you're trying to communicate something, if it doesn't work compositionally at the size of a matchbox label, it might be great to see it in person, but it won't communicate something particularly well through social media because mm. it's going to be shrunk down to a very small size. Yeah. So by collecting a lot of like different things from the past, it's helped given us a perspective on elements of where we are today, of mm. design, of advertising, of art, of things that other people might overlook. But all of these things kind of blend together 100%. in culture. Yeah. And culture is the sum total of all of this stuff around us, I think. It is. Because they're all sort of like, they're all images that influence us. So your culture is the images that you're exposed to day by day, the mm. sounds that you hear day by day. Some of that is art, some of that is advertising. And they cross over. Loads mm. of successful artists, John Hassel, I, loads of like, to lose a track, et cetera, et cetera, had careers like uh, the Chupa Chups logo was designed by Salvador Incredible. Dali. Incredible, yeah. The Renault logo was designed by Victor Vassarelli. Yeah. There's so many, like the crossover between art and commercial has been there for a very long they time. they just stick. They stick. Mm. What is the secret of that look, that feel, that design of the, the brand? Of making something stick. Well, like Chupa Chups being a yeah. know, great example of yeah. that. Wow. Um, so I guess, uh, so it's a question of what makes something memorable, yeah. really. Um, often it's simplicity. Mm -hmm. The more complicated an image is, the more, the more someone tries to tell you, the less you're going to remember. If I had like one or two or three things that I wanted people to get out of today, and I was clear and I said that, but I necessarily do, that's what people might take away from this. Mm -hmm. Or it's usually it's the one thing that one of us will say that someone will remember that sticks. Mm -hmm. No one takes the whole 40 minutes of information. It's just too much yeah, for yeah. people to digest. One little golden nugget so is the thing. Yeah, that, that's that, right. And that is why, in a very, especially in a very like cluttered environment of culture, where we're bombarded and we receive images from everywhere so often, mm. simplifying the message down to, here's the thing that you need to get. Mm. This is the message that we're trying to land. This is the visual of it. And that's why logos can be very powerful because they're really it's like a shrunk down thing mm. that is memorable or not. And it's really interesting that so many of like companies' logos, people saw the posts on this stuff over the last few years, everything got simplified because mm. it was all under, they call it pixel pressure, but everything's being shrunk down so it can be seen on a phone. Mm -hmm. But as a result, you know, everything from like the Facebook logo to so many other brands just now looks like the same logo, <laughs> but the word is different. That's not very memorable anymore. No. Um, standing out, you know, the thing that's weird is the thing that stands out, that makes something more memorable. But it's really interesting that, you know, brands don't want to do that, people are afraid to do that. Mm. Artists, incidentally, aren't. Mm. Artists were always the, are the innovative fringes of society. Yeah. They're like, although it changes with the internet, because there's the risk that more styles are homogenized and, you know, but whatever, but that, what helps a lot of artists is some level of isolation yeah. to go away and be weird. And that allows you to be a little bit different yeah. in a way or like you know you pick and choose your influences carefully mm. and to the extent someone can be a little bit weird is probably same for a brand is something that makes it memorable mm. <laughs> okay right so <laughs> let's go to operations now sure. operations and at this point i'd like to big up greg and all the crew uh at global street art hold tight uh, i know you're watching <laughs> bated breath <laughs> if you haven't heard these conversations enough in a week but this is a good one uh <laughs> operations yeah so 
what's the what's the what's the protocol for um, artists? Like, what do you look for in? I mean, obviously they got to be great, yeah. but when you're dealing with teams, yeah, and this is a fragile, you know, artists can be sensitive as fuck. Yeah, absolutely. Like, how do you how do you manage a team to that scale, and what do you look for? So it depends if you're talking about artists that are working together as a team for like hand painted advertising, mm. a client's design, or if an artist is doing their own thing. Um, where you're, you kind of answered your own question a little bit, which is if you're working in teams. You need people that are really good at working in teams mm -hmm. where people have got each other's back. We've got an amazing ops department um, just of people that work like super hard together. Mm -hmm. That is where you can have, you know, like if someone's got all the skills, but they don't get on with other people, that's a very difficult person to work with mm. on site. You would much rather take someone who had a lower skill level, but really got everyone sort of fired up and they can paint those bits of the mural, mm. right? There's, there's ways that you put a, a sort of team together to do that. It's a little bit different when you're working with artists who have, their own style, mm -hmm. um, or or it's because they're they're then in a position of like that individual. It's it's about their artwork, their piece, etc. Mm -hmm. So you try and build a team more around them to support them. Wow! Um, because they're going to want to lead. It's got to look in a certain way because they are also. I don't want to say an artist is a brand, because but what I mean is. The artist is very careful about their image and what goes out in the world. Mm. If the mural at the end of it doesn't, they're not proud of it, you shouldn't have painted it. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of technique and process that we use behind the scenes to make sure that the mural is certainly accurate, but you also have to try and build a team around that artist to support them on their yeah, journey. Yeah, for sure. And and, and how, how deep do you have to go to getting that... Co I mean, you, you've worked with some amazing artists. Yeah, we've worked with almost everyone. Zombie more recently it. as well, actually, yeah. haven't you? you know. Brilliant. Yeah. What, like, Zombie yeah. is like... I have to be careful what I say only because when I say zombie is lovely, that's probably not what like the audience is gonna hear. But there's like so many like, to be honest, like legends within the London graffiti scene are just super humble, mm. super talented, and just really cool to work I wanna with. Wanna get on with it. I wanna get on with it. And like I couldn't I don't think we could do enough, say, to support someone like mm -hmm. like Zombie because mm. He's just great to work with. Mm -hmm. Um and not everyone is, but I think um, you know, there's this Graffiti recruits, as a subculture, recruits people from lots of different backgrounds. Mm. Some people have more trouble, some people have less trouble, some people just really love painting, some people really like different aspects mm -hmm. of that, of that uh, 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 culture. Mm -hmm. I've, I've had conversation, I remember having a conversation with Twesh years ago where we were talking about Another like- Another great writer as well, wow. Life in like, com commercial life and people working in like commercial jobs, yeah. et cetera. I was like, for, for people that have like stood in a train yard and mm. had that adrenaline, et cetera, et cetera, a client email should not piss you off, mm. right? The, the, I say this also to like my B-boys as mm. well. It's like, you've been, you've, you've got a style. You've had a collection of mistakes. You've figured out a style. You've dedicated, you've got this get up and go to dedicate yourself enough mm. to elevating your craft to a certain level. Don't think that those aren't transferable skills mm -hmm. because quite a bit of what you've learned is really useful in other spheres. 100%. And like, there's something that for a lot of writers as well, specifically graffiti writers, quite a lot of good storytellers. Mm -hmm. Because after the mission is the story and telling your mates. Now you come to think, now you come to mention it, there, there has been quite a few st yeah. <laughs> stories I've heard. And they have like wild stories <laughs> often. Stories. But like, that's also a narrative skill, yeah. which is also, you know, it can be applied in different ways. Yeah. And I, I think hip hop, I'm going to say, because Graf is, I mean, early writers were more listening to the Ramones yeah, than they were in hip hop, but the elements of hip hop culture are really, have a, they, they, people can get a lot out of them that I don't think they get credit for. The, the, the elements, the cultures get mm. credit for. Like the quick wit of a lot of rappers. The upskilling you know, of... The, the, the upskilling yeah. of everyone. And it's, it's the one of the beautiful thing about hip hop is, historically, it didn't cost much to be part of mm. it. You danced. Yeah. You could walk, you could dance. You cheap could, to enter. Yeah, cheap to enter. And there aren't, I mean, there are some sub, other subcultures, like, but I broadly say, like, TikTok or social media and creating content that are not too expensive to enter, mm -hmm. right? But, but you just need a phone and mm -hmm. I do. But um, I, I think that the recruit, like, a lot of people, I think, learn a lot through hip hop. Yeah. You know, and got to good places. And I, I owe hip hop one. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have. 
I, I'm a completely different person because I danced. I had a team I was doing that with that I'm still involved with today, that I love dearly today, and that I've been around it. What I do professionally and what we do professionally is quite different to those elements of the culture. It doesn't always overlap. But you Again, can reform that. Like, you can reform that. That, like you were saying, you can. It can be part there. of it. Yeah. yeah, it can be part of it because we have friends. Yeah. Because we have people that have been involved in those cultures that yeah. have done those things. But it, whether or not a client chooses to work with us on that basis, mm. isn't it funny? Because we talk all about what we want to do, and 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 how we do it. But you know, and and that we want to work with artists in this way, etc. Mm. But often it just comes down to if you can do it, is, is the funding there? Yes. And yes. then it's a client's decision. And yeah. whether that client is a public body that you applied to funds or a brand or something else, you're still often at the mercy of where the resource comes from mm -hmm. that enables you to do it. Yeah. Um, which is one of the reasons that we started just giving our excess paint away and being like, here's a wall, do what you want. But even then, that comes with restrictions. Because mm -hmm. if an artist is working in a housing estate, there's images that people who live there don't want to see every day. Mm. So you have to be kind of careful. But you know, most of the artists that we work with obviously get that. Yeah, and yeah, so yeah. there's very few problems. But in I practice. think with businesses, especially, is that creative. There wasn't enough creative thinkers in business anyway, to be honest. If you sit mm. around a table, you know, you want the majority of them to be, you know, great ideas and creatives mm. to then start, you know, implementing ideas formally to then be processed to the people that need to do the moving and shake it financially or otherwise. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be in the culture, yeah. that's that's your strongest position, particularly in those spaces, because you're able to add value. And sometimes I feel, okay, not everything is calculative financially. Yeah. Sometimes you just got to jump on it, get in it, prove the concept, yeah. be creative, yeah. make a mess, package it up, get it out. I don't know many clients that have got the patience for no, that. No, I don't think so. Um, but I don't want to wait for clients to do the stuff that we really want to do, which yeah. is why we do London Mural Festival, yeah. because the mission is live in painted cities. That lives up to that mission. Yeah. So who cares if it costs money? Like mm. Ultimately, it's like, that's what we're on the, that's why the organization exists. So that's what you're mm. supposed to do. I, I, I find it quite issue. We talk a lot about creatives and creative. Uh, uh, within the industry, because like within like the creative industries, there are people whose title is a creative, mm -hmm. and they're supposed to be able to have ideas. I think the danger of that is it leaves other people in those organisations feeling like they're excluded from having creative ideas. It's true. Um, yes. I find a lot of people that can have really good ideas don't think of themselves as creative. Mm. What we've tried to do more in the last year, really is bring people in to help them be creative. And I don't mean on the artist side particularly, I'm, although there is always an ongoing effort, but I really mean more on like the client side. Mm -hmm. You can help people have a wider range of ideas and set up group working dynamics so people share ideas and don't shoot them down too quickly, mm -hmm. which is something else which is a problem in all creative companies, yes, yes. is if the idea isn't fully formed and ready, it's often shot down. You mm -hmm. see that even in like in the built environment, architects, when they finish their degree, they have something that's called a crit, which is literally a criticism. So you, or a, a, a critique, you have your building that you've designed and then you go there and then someone rips it apart. So the architects that tend to then go on and succeed in that environment have got the thick skin to take that criticism in wow. the first place, but that's not necessarily encouraging people that are more collaborative yeah. into that industry. Yeah. So there are endemic in it, like challenges in most industries that stifle people's creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say, you know, within uh, advertising, for example, one of the pressures is time. Mm -hmm. People don't have or choose to take the time to have a wider range of ideas. No, that's right. And then unless the idea is presented in some PowerPoint somewhere as being fully formed to a client, it's often shot down. But an aspect of it could have been amazing if it was combined with this or this or this or this. So helping take clients on that journey where they don't shoot things down so quickly is part of what we've kind of been working on, which is sort of like the idea of being like an inspiration partner mm -hmm. um, as opposed to like as opposed to I'm not sure what else, but however people see us, what we're trying to do with, with clients, partners, and artists is be this inspiration partner where there's resource, by which I mean reference material mm. and techniques that help people ultimately get more out of themselves. Because mm. it doesn't matter how strong we are as an organization, if we want other people to believe in the Painted City's message and help us carry that message further, we'll get a lot further if we can be inspiring to the people around us. Mm. So we're trying to really formalize what that looks like mm. to be, all right, come in for an hour, 
and we will inspire you. Mm -hmm. And here's what that program looks like. And and ultimately, if that works and people like you, they might want to work with you more. And so, so that happens. Kind of, that happens. Yeah. For, so interesting, man. Like your your level of clarity. I mean, for starters, I don't expect it. God, I think minute. it was bad twenty years ago. Well, this but. is what I'm saying. So because we're all we're all learning as we go. But yeah. you know what you're talking about there, from a distinctive value adding to the yeah the broader culture, the outer yeah. fringes, it's not even, you know, may not even, it could be any brand, architecture being yeah, one yeah, of them. Yeah. Um, you know, companies, you know, this is these are these are um fixes yeah. from a creative point that allows people within companies to think more clearly and yeah. creatively. Yes, we do ha so there's two forms of thinking that you can have creatively, right? There's divergent thinking and convergent thinking. So divergent thinking is when you're come trying to come up with a wider range of ideas that's at the start. You then want to like have it converge down to whatever your final solutions or solutions mm -hmm. are, but you're not going to get there in one go. So the final idea that's really good that you've seen presented has already gone on a journey. Mm -hmm. But because we often see the end result, you don't see the thinking or the journey that mm. went behind it, which is the effort. So we try and help people on that path. Um, but yeah, I mean, if we can help people express their ideas more clearly or have a wider range of ideas, or just leave feeling a little bit inspired, that's enough. Mm. Well, the, the only sort of promise that I've made lately to people visiting us is if they visit us for an hour, it won't be a waste of their time. Now, mm. that sounds really... At this, it, that's, there's, a, there's a split in how I present that. In one way, that sounds like if there's something really cool they can see and we're going to really inspire them, mm. then just saying it won't be a waste of their time almost sounds a little bit too... Humble. It's not selling the, the, the idea or the concept of Got what you. we can provide enough. But on the other hand, if I can say that anyone that comes to visit us it won't be a waste of their time. It means that whatever the thing is that we're providing has got to be useful to a broad enough range of people mm -hmm. that it's just not a waste of time. In a, in a world post-COVID where most people work from home, getting someone to come in and visit our office when they don't often visit their own office that takes a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. And that's why we just humbly say, you know, try and say that's like, you know, come in and visit, it won't be a waste of your time. And that's been enough for enough people to come and visit us. Oh, the amount of times I've asked for your advice or come in and we'd started chatting. I mean, you're an open page so far as, you know, transparent communication on ideas and things that may be conflicting yeah. for, for people that you're talking to. I mean, yeah. it's, it's really incredible. There's a lot of... Um, I guess there's a couple of things. Oh, I get to do something on a podcast I've not done before because this will be quite fun. Um, <laughs> the, the, the spirit that sits underneath that is one of my favorite words. It's basically Ubuntu, empowering yourself by empowering the people around you. I just want to see, we ultimately want to see people succeed. And it's a wonderful thing to be a part of some, a, an artist's early journey and then seeing them years later absolutely smashing it. Mm. What a wonderful thing to have been part so of. Especially much. when you're not an artist yourself, to be able to be an important less than 1% of someone's journey, but just a key step or a mm -hmm. something, that's a really cool thing. Your, your, your living is what you make, your life is what you give. So there's, you know, it's ultimately your, your legacy to people is how much you got to inspire other people mm. and put your ideas or help other people have better ideas mm. as well. Um, it all comes from that word Ubuntu. It's one of my favorite words. So I have a cool. tattoo of it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, inside my lip. That's my first tattoo is the word Show Ubuntu. Show me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Stop it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think you want to keep the words that matter to you close to your lips. That's the word Ubuntu. Basically means empowering yourself by empowering the people around you. I've always believed in it. My old B-boy crew... Uh, and I said this years ago, when, when we were starting out, I was like, look, if we ever make something out of Global Street Art, you guys have got a place to train. Mm -hmm. And my crew, team, still comes in and trains every week. That's they move amazing. the stuff out the week, uh, out the way, and, and, and they just train. And when subculture, like I said before, culture is so fragile mm -hmm. in that it's got very little resource behind it generally, broad mm -hmm. cultures. Just knowing that my old b-boy crew has got a place to train <sighs> that they've got the card for yeah. is a good thing for them, but it just... It's once you've gone to the hard work and effort of having an office, essentially, what an amazing thing to be able to give. That's a privilege, mm. but also there's a responsibility. And I'm, I'm always driven by like the how else, who, who else could we be helping? Mm. What else does that look like? But then that butts up with the practicals of like how much free time have you got? Oh, so it's that. not easy. Yeah. How do you stay organized, Lee? How do you, because you, there's a lot of things. I don't going sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not married. I don't have kids, <laughs> yeah. right? I've really done I've things. I've got to like, figure up on that one. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. That I've, is a huge weight I've, off your shoulders. Eh? Really, it does free up quite a lot of time, yeah. right? Um, 
how to stay on top of it. I always feel like I'm slightly drowning. You know, I think everyone does. <laughs> that's part of the, that's part of the, 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 the get up and go, isn't I it? I can't think of anything else I would do. Yeah. Like, I'm unhirable. <laughs> like at this stage, yeah. what other career? You've gone too far I've, forward I've and too far back. Far too far. Yeah. yeah. Like I, so just being able to do this, and I, I, I am so serious about that long-term legacy that I want to start, like, have been part of something that that lasts longer because mm. ultimately, it should be a force of good in the world. Yeah. Um, and I think as a, it, it depends what you're sort of comparing what we do as a company to how you will look at us. Mm -hmm. If you're comparing us to other forms of advertising, you have a very big pic different picture. Wow, that's really cool, that's cool, it's better than this or that or the other. Then if you're comparing us to just art, oh, it's mm -hmm. a shame that those guys do the big adverts, dot, 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 I'd much rather big murals. How, they're, they're not mutually exclusive. Yeah, 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 yeah. We do more of this and then it helps the other one as well. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, I think one of the more interesting narratives is we're, we're sort of like defending the human. In a world of like, AI and digital, uh, uh, AI driven creativity and just sort of AI, our roles, our jobs are going to be very different For a real. year from now. I mean, yeah. my job is now so different than it was three months ago because mm. of the tools we use. I'm really worried, you know, we're, I'm, I'm kind of like the value of the human 20, 30 years from mm. now. AI is is so powerful. It's gonna happen. It, yeah, it, out, it beats a lot of my ideas for a lot of stuff. Yeah, or like its organization is certainly so much better. It can lay out a document with reasonable headings. Yeah, in no time. What? It's the value that I can bring into that. And I think, you know, we're all going to be sort of somewhat at risk. Yeah. There's, there's huge changes to the job market mm. uh, and huge changes to just about everything. So I, I love the fact that we're somewhat insulated from that, I think. Yes. Because we're purposefully celebrating human. Mm -hmm. And if that's your frame, then I think what we're doing now and what we're doing in cities, artists painting large murals and London Mural Festival, all of those kind of things, is probably more relevant than it ever has been. Mm. Because it's the counter to more digital. Yeah, more digital, right. more digital. Or a counter to. Um, random question. Like, uh, I always ask this to musicians, you know, what's your batting average if there was, uh, you know, 25 demos that you took all week doing, you know. Yeah. Which, how, how many within 25 is a major hit? What in terms of, <laughs> in terms of you know, productions? Yeah. Any stick out as being like a major, like this leveraged the comp. This was an incredible moment for the comp. This changed everything. This was your number one single that went twenty five uh, weeks in the in the I, charts. I, I think every business, like every creative, has breaks. There were breaks early on, where. Before we did any commercial walls, we knew we wanted to live in painted cities. We knew we wanted to work with artists. We'd organize a couple of hundred completely non-commercial, pure art walls, matching artists with spaces, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. There was a really early project where someone basically said, can you, it was EasyJet's in-flight magazine, paint something that looks like you're walking from a city into a beach. So paint a beach scene. And we knew an artist, we knew how much paint it would take to do it we knew a landlord and it was basically what we'd been doing anyway but more or less with a logo mm -hmm. on it. and then the penny drops and it was like oh there's an agency model that might make us sustainable mm -hmm. when the last three gallery shows didn't make any money and it, it's that kind that that was was sort of one of them we did a really awesome project for fendi uh well, quite a few years ago mm -hmm. now where we designed in-house uh, um, an asset for Fendi that we painted on the roof of their headquarters in Rome that was filmed by a drone. We put the design together really quickly, but it was the right design for that space. Wow. Uh, and Fendi bought the rights to it, put on a T-shirt with their logo in the middle. It was their top-selling T-shirt that wow. year. We did two collections with them since. That was a really great realisation of how artists, we could work directly with brands doing really cool stuff if we weren't only doing the advertising stuff that we're doing. Gotcha. So it made us want to broaden that out a little bit, but it's then taken a long time to be even anywhere near being able to do that. So that was like a really big swing for the fences because we, uh, two years, a couple of years after that, we worked with Pref, mm -hmm. uh, who's amazing, yes. um, and provided Fendi with other designs that went on a whole range. Mm -hmm. So they released a, a, a range that had like 40 items or so with Pref's design on it. Wow. That was a major luxury fashion, fashion brand. What an awesome experience. Mm. It's quite hard to repeat that. Yes. We had another one even earlier this year, which was a really interesting one. The gallery that we've built, which is our in-house museum, we call it the gallery, is a special space. It's, it's cool. Um, we, 
I sourced most of the objects that are in there from eBay because that's where you would do it. Mm -hmm. So we did one video with content with eBay, uh, which I really enjoyed. And it had a million views on Instagram and a million views on TikTok. And I had someone called me from like, oh, I saw this and this, and they were in South Africa. And it was great. We're like, oh, actually this, this message, this narrative around preserving past creativity, uh, the work of creatives past, mm -hmm might go somewhere that's not what we're normally known for. Like Unfortunately, it. the person that we were working with at eBay was lovely, Jack, uh, left eBay soon mm -hmm. after, so we were kind of left with nowhere to go. So it, that's just an example. Like, we can move in, in different directions and we'll get beyond that, but it gave me some reassurance that beyond the art stuff and beyond the advertising stuff, that the collecting, curating, museum-y stuff might not be totally mad, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but it might be mad. <laughs> so, can never we quite tell. Well, we, we shall see. What's the future, my brother? What is the future? Um, there are absolutes and there are directions. We mm -hmm. set our organisation up to live with, to, with a mission to live in painted cities. I do think our cities have got every chance of being painted more in future. I think fundamentally that is good for artists and artist opportunities. I'd like to see within this country legal and regulatory changes. I don't know what that looks like yet, but that just, not even necessarily legal, but like infrastructure changes mm -hmm. that make it easier for people to learn to paint, easier for people to have a career as a working artist yeah. uh, and steps in, in that sort of direction. I guess I'd like us to operate a building at some point um, more because like like this in Arts Arcade, mm -hmm. when you have a space, the, the wonderful things you can do with it yeah. are, are myriad, it's right? Crazy. You can have dancers in, you can mm -hmm. have shows and exhibitions, you can do all of those wonderful mm -hmm. things. So that's an aim, mm -hmm. but it's not, you know, I, I don't know when mm -hmm. we could kind of get there. I think you're always, I'm always sort of like treading a line between is this realistic or possible? To what part of it is fantasy and are we, I, slightly crazy? But that doesn't also doesn't mean you might be wrong. Yeah, you might true. be slightly crazy, but still it might work. Yeah. And so you don't know that yet. Watch my feet. You so, know what I mean? So, yeah. I'll, see, I'll see you when I'm right. We'll try, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll try. Yeah. Um, and so I can't... I sat next to a guy at a wedding once and he said... His name was Ashley. He had a really strong New York accent. He said... Uh, he was a business guy. He said, Lee... I love what you guys have built. It's great. What's your exit strategy? What's your exit strategy? <laughs> Classic question. Yeah, and I said, uh, actually, I'm going to die. <laughs> I can't see myself doing anything else that this hasn't been part of mm. because I love it to bits. I still love working with artists when I get to do it. Mm -hmm. I, I actually really enjoy like the pressure of the advertising projects, the short turnaround, the mm. we managed to make this at the end of it. God, yeah, it's an good. advert, but it's hard to bloody do yeah. it. Um, and so I kind of get a lot of work satisfaction out of this holistically, mm. way more than I did in anything else that I was doing before. Mm. When I was, after I danced, I was a scientist years ago. Mm -hmm. I was doing HIV research for a wow. while. I was studying in Seattle briefly. I had a b-boy crew out there. Shout out to Barnyard Cannibals. Oh, yeah. um, but while I was, was studying out there, I kind of realized that within science, you're part of a big science team. You might want to get your name on a paper but you're going to be in a big team and you're going to be like, I couldn't see how I could make a difference mm -hmm. in the same way in that industry. Now working in like with artists in somewhere between art, street art, public art, advertising, all of this area, I can see more opportunity to have a positive legacy than in anything else I've tried before. Oh, that's such a good, yeah, absolutely. My brother, thank you so much for joining Thank you. <laughs> you are. I guess a, I talked um, off your ears, but no I, I, I way. Think that's I mean, what we're supposed this to do, is right? That's so. right, you know? <laughs> Man, seasoned in the game. It, honestly, it's been an absolute pleasure dissecting and getting into it, yeah? Though, do you know, it's a rare occurrence to get so in depth. So I hope you learn a lot, you lot. Um, we're out like that. Street Culture Podcast. More on the way. Big shout Lee Bofkin. Global teach one, teach one. That's the one. <laughs> Killer Kalala means our fashion, all right? Stay lucky, people. Easy. <laughs>